I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I am Pranay Kotasthane and I have with me Lieutenant General Prakash Menon. And today we are going to talk about this Department of Military Affairs in uh, which has been created recently. And General Menon had an article on this uh, journal article which talked about the human capital requirement of this Department of Military Affairs. So I thought it was interesting to first understand what this department. of military affairs is why is it a big deal and then try to work out what are the types of human capital requirements that might be needed for it so uh, general man and welcome first i want to know what is this department of military affairs and why is it a big deal well actually uh, it is the newly created department of military affairs uh, which came along with the with the institution of the post of the cds who also is wears the uh, hat of the head of department of the department of military affairs wears another hat of the permanent chairman chief of staff committee so the mm-hmm. department of military affairs has been hived off of what used to be the department of defense so it's a newly created department and it is supposed to be dealing with matters which are purely or mostly military in nature and distinguished from the department of defense which has got a broader remit of defense and military being an important subsect and a large portion of defense but defense is certainly a broader uh, uh, term and uh, this now is the uh, the department which is been mandated it has under it the three services the headquarters ideas the territorial army and it is also responsible for the revenue procurement it, it has been mandated to the cds has been mandated to bring in jointness improve the indigenous content and been given a, a very great responsibility so the first time we see that there is an integrated presence of the military in the ministry of defense previously the military were not in the ministry they were subordinate officers they call call them whatever they call them but they were subordinate officers now they are part of the ministry of defense i mean they have a department there so this is a major major step in integration of the armed forces in the ministry of defense and it's been a demand which has been pending for a long time uh nobody expected this to come now but i think what has been done is truly has the potential for improving civil military relations and therefore realizing the potential of the military so it has great promise right so uh, as i understand probably this is the first time a military department head will like have both civil and military staff under him is that the first time and it wasn't there before yeah actually if you really look at it and we miss start understanding this from what were the recommendations which followed the uh, uh, kargal review committee that is the group of ministers report who actually had recommended at that time the cds and uh, they said these attached offices is insufficient we should have more representation in the ministry of defense but eventually the cds did not come about there were resistance from many quarters including the indian air force there was resistance from the bureaucracy there was also political will to implement it also was lacking but therefore 
what has been done now in the creation of the CDS post, the creation of the military department, surely is a step which uh, which must be now taken to its conclusion. And that depends upon the human agency which actually populate these newly created structures. And the, therefore, the challenge for DMA is about how do you populate this with the correct mix of expertise and also give them fair amount of tenure, at least for five years, so they can actually contribute their maximum. These are the twin challenges of the human capital in DMA. And they cannot be met by the existing staffing procedures, which is meant for the civil staff, that is still civil staffing cadres. So will I, I would think that unless they tweak that and they can do it and make sure that both the civilian content and the military content are properly trained, experienced, and also given a reasonable tenure is what should be attempted at this point in time. Right. So, uh, as I understand, the earlier problem was that, again, the military uh, instrument uh, or the decisions on that had to be going through the civilian bureaucracy for any of the political decision making. So, do you think in this case, because it has split the military uh, interaction with the civil, uh, with the political uh, um, masters will sort of uh, improve? Yes, certainly it will. Because one of the common complaints, as you said, was that the interaction between the politician and military leaders was being arbitrated through a civil bureaucracy which did not have the expertise or generalists to deal with the subject. This was the major thing which had to be thought of. Uh, the, the reform had to address this. So it has been done by put, making this military department. But whether it is done across the MOD is a different issue. For that matter, the, de, uh, the Department of Defense still has the same problem, still has the lack of expertise, still has major responsibilities for itself, and therefore, I would think that actually this sort of reform in the human capital has to be spread across the entire Ministry of Defense. And you need to have people who are having expertise in the subject, have a cadre which is trained and experienced to serve in positions and places for which you would normally not get training elsewhere. And in fact, the Kargil and the group of ministers had recommended, and it has been approved by the cabinet, that you will have a cadre of people from civil services who would actually rotate between the MOD, the MHA, the MEA, and other national security agencies, so that they would bring that experience into their jobs, and they should have a special cadre for it. But as usual... It was examined by a committee of secretaries who said that it cannot be done because of cadre management problems mm. and it was never implemented. So here we have another chance because uh, as far as the DMA is concerned, certainly the existing staffing procedure will not meet its requirement because let's, I mean, I, when I'm talking about staffing, I, I'm talking about people who are the director, joint uh, secretaries, secretaries, and so on. Because if you take the services element, it will be very difficult for getting a senior person of that, either a major general or a lieutenant general, who will be able to serve for that period of five years. Because what will happen is, either he will retire if he's a lieutenant general, or he will have to go elsewhere to fulfill another requirement called command and so on. So with the existing career progression methodology of the services, they can't provide a major general because he will either go on promotion or he'll go on retirement. Five years, it will be difficult to keep him. So they'll have to have special provisions. And the civil, while this does not 
apply as far as tenure to the civil, it applies for expertise. So even for the civil, we need to lay down that these must be people who have, who have actually done certain courses in their during their careers at the Defense Services Staff College where there are vacancies for civilians in the, in the College of Defense Management at the National Defense College and so on, where they can get certain exposure to military affairs and the military people also need to be exposed similarly to civil affairs. Because here at the Ministry of Defense is where this intersection takes place. Because frankly speaking, as time goes on, the civil-military fusion requirements are increasing. Mm. If you just take the world of cyber, for that matter, or space, I mean, this is not a, a, a purely military sphere or a civilian sphere. This is something which overla- overlaps a hell of a lot. So the military-civil fusion is going to increase with time. So we need to we need to actually populate the departments, and I'm, we are not talking about DMA, but I would think even the other departments with certain specializations, which spans not only military affairs but also civil affairs. I guess uh, the fact that we are a nuclear power also makes things different, right? You can't apply the military instrument in a similar way that you can if you are not a nuclear power. So there again, the role of the civil-military interaction becomes very important, I guess. You see, uh, as far as the nuclear issue is concerned, where it becomes most important is between the understanding what the politician has and what the military has as part of the military instrument. That both of them must be very clear in their mind what can be asked to the military, what the military can do as an instrument of the politics. And the politicians should be very clear about the risk involved in using force under the nuclear shadow. And this can only come about by a constant interaction or a dialogue between military leaders and political leaders. And that is why the CDS, one of his main tasks, and he's also going to be with the hat of the permanent chairman chief of staff, to be, he's going to actually also be in the nuclear command authority chain and he will look after the strategic forces command so now we have got somebody who can actually, he is not, he is full time in a crisis or during conventional war available to the politician. Otherwise, previously, there was a chief of, let's say, the Army, Navy, the Air Force, who also had to fight a war and be available to the politician for advice on nuclear issues. You know, it was a difficult thing to actually, in practice, it would have been very difficult. We now reach that point. All this must therefore be underpinned by a greater interaction between the CDS and the politicians. Because both need to understand the the requirements of the other. The politicians, remember, are a different type of people who attention span is short, who actually looks for immediate short-term gains, whereas the military are always looking for things in the long term, especially in terms of military preparations and so on. And when crises are taking place, the military has to make a judgment of what does the politician want us to achieve and how much is the force and in what manner should it be applied to deliver to the politician what you want. That is general, that is the requirement of, or the demand of general, generalship, that they have to convert the political requirement into military force, apply it and make sure create a political effect. It's challenging because there is no currency. You can say conversion here. Each context will determine how it is to be applied, where it is to be applied to achieve a particular effect. And that effect is not military. It finally has to be decided in political terms. So what the CDS and and now brings to the table is the possibility that this can be achieved easier, that there will be more, more, more uh, at least space for this achievement. That's what it does. And the DMA is actually which one which will determine after this realization, even in the planning process, the planning process would be what sort of a ministry instrument do you want? You convert your political objectives to military power. What sort of military power do you want? 
that to make the resources available to the joint service, which is again headed by the CDS in the hat of a permanent chairman, is what his role is. So it will involve, and especially when the budget is short, prioritization, shelving of something, but it has to come from a holistic consideration. It cannot be just done by you feel like you want to do something. No, it has to be seen in a much larger context because military preparations take a long time, 10 years, 15 years. So the decisions you take today have long-term effect. And that is going to be the challenge. So the military being in the Ministry of Defense can influence. Firstly, they are on the demand side. They can try to convince the politician better that we need this. And that must be based on some reasoning which is military in nature. Must be decided not unilaterally by the CDS or permanent seven chief staff by taking all the chiefs along. It must be a combined approach. So the demand must be created combinedly. Now to meet that demand, the DMA plays a vital role because it can influence the allotment of resources. At the higher level, the CDS can even go to the defense minister or the prime minister and saying this is definitely what is required. Otherwise, something is at stake. You can try and explain it. Eventually, the politicians have to decide how resources are going to be distributed. And as things get bad, as COVID-19 creates an economic devastation, they are going to be competing demands. But security cannot be subjected to the same type of perspective which you will do to other ministries because you can't, you can do whatever you want to the others. But if geopolitical tensions are rising and if geopolitical frictions are going to go greater, then you can't say that you'll, you'll also apply 30% to Ministry of Defense like you did to all other ministries. But the consideration for this must be much larger, must be holistic. So, so the role of the DMA here, one of the major roles now is this allocation or how to make sure they get the resources and allocate it based on what he does as the permanent chairman, chief of staff, which is a military strategy, which is drawn from a political guidance. So the uh, given the role of DMA that you described, I am assuming that they would also require, say, expertise in economics, say, expertise in other areas in order, even strategy, right? How to convert the uh, military instrument for political aims. So all, that's why I think the human capital requirement might also have to uh, take people from other areas or educate them about these matters as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the sense that if we think that it is all available in the military, let me tell you, it is not. So we'll have to induct it from wherever it is available from outside, even from the private sector. And that is why I suggest in my paper, they should adopt the model which is there in the National Security Council Secretariat, which has got a dispensation for getting people from within the government, from outside the government, keeping them for much longer, five years, 10 years, and keeping them in as consultants, keeping them, you know, you can actually have different types of people in that organization, all trying to meet its purpose. So the staffing rules which exist in the MOD cannot possibly meet these requirements. So they will have to move a CCS note, which now, because he is a departmental head, he'll have to convince the rest, he'll have to convince the RM, take it to the CCS, who will have to approve a model. It is not going to cost extra money. In fact, that is not the issue here. What it's going to do, it's going to bring in the best available people for the longest possible time. That is why you need a model like that. The present one does not meet that requirement. Thanks a lot, General Menon. So this it was very educative to understand why this is a big move and what are the human capital requirements. We will again link the paper to this episode and our listeners can go and download the paper and read more about the changes that are going on in civil-military relations. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. 
The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money. Do definitely check out our social media accounts. We've been doing some really cool stuff over there. There are a bunch of recommendations from hosts. I think you'll really enjoy the content that we're putting out there. And make sure you don't miss your favorite show. Cyrus Says has been putting out some great stuff, as is the Prakati Podcast, All About Policy. has been doing some really, really fun stuff. The guys at Football Shootball and Football Twaddle are continuing to release episodes as well, which are really interesting. Vesa Vesa Anubam has been having like guest after guest just killing it. Pulia Bazi has been doing so well. Postcards from Nowhere. All these shows are really, really doing well and really, really putting out great stuff. Appreciate all the efforts that the hosts are putting in in the lockdown. And thanks for listening, and we hope to catch you again next week. Are you constantly seeking happiness? Wondering how to make the most of every day? How not to let your inhibitions stop you from achieving your goals? It's now time to get your A-game on. It's time to unlock your true potential. Tune in to the empowering series with me, Zarina Poonawala, to feel empowered in all genres of life. From behavioral skills to management skills, from health to relationships, from mental well-being to emotional well-being, and of course, your finances. I've got you covered. With these tips and tricks from me, Zarina, and true life stories from my amazing guests, you're bound to bring your purest to the table. Tune in to the empowering series with Zarina Punawala every Thursday on the IVM podcast app, website, or wherever you listen to podcasts.